Right, so uh, good afternoon and welcome to the second panel of today's conference on digitalization and company law, which is organized by the notaries of Europe. I'm Frédéric Simon, the energy and environment editor of your active, and I will be your host for today's uh, event, which is titled Opportunities and Challenges for the EU's Digital Age. Now, during this session, we will look into past and current digitalization projects that have taken place when it comes to company law. And based on that, we will then broaden the discussion to hot topics like artificial intelligence and the challenges and opportunities that this brings for people working in legal professions. So how far have we gone when it comes to digitalization in uh, the legal professions and uh, the judiciary? And will lawyers and notaries one day be replaced by robots? To discuss this topic today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Andreas Schwab. He's member of the European Parliament for the center-right EPP group. Next to him is uh, Simona Konstantin. She's deputy head of cabinet of Commission President Vera Jourova in charge of values and transparency. Next is Jens Bormann. He's president of the German Federal Chamber of Notaries. Uh, next to him is Tianyu Yuan, he's CEO of Codify, a tech company based uh, in Germany. And finally, we have Mr. Ramon Franco Cerame, he's CEO of Mr. Houston Tech Solutions, a digital technology company uh, based in Spain. So welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. We'll start with um, a brief introduction from each of uh, the panelists, and then we'll move on to a panel discussion, which is also open to questions uh, from the audience. If you're online, uh, please use the Slido platform to put uh, your questions uh, to the panelists, and we will make a selection uh, from those. And for those here physically with us in the room, there will be a microphone circulating, so you can put your questions uh, directly to the speakers. So um, I think that's all for me when it comes to the introduction. So uh, let me start immediately uh, with the opening question for you, uh, Andreas uh, Schwab. So from your perspective um, as a policymaker, what are the, the opportunities and the challenges uh, when it comes to digitalization in the judiciary? Does it work? Yes, it works. Good afternoon. Um, it's a, a very general question, I have to tell you, Frederic, uh, because uh, it, I could dwell about that for quite a while. I would say that in the recently adopted AI Act, we have been trying to be very clear about what our most important concerns are as a lawmaker. And this is for sure that we have a certain number of risk-based applications for artificial intelligence that we have to control um, well. Um, we came to the conclusion that that can be best done at European level, because you cannot make for every city council a different AI admission procedure. You have to do it uh, at European level. Um, and we hope that the Commission is, and I say that with a lot of respect, but I hope that the Commission is able to do this, because AI is a very complex tool, and so far I don't see new positions, new manpower for this, um, but maybe we can try to change that in the budgetary procedure. And thirdly, obviously, we have also put into that law that there has always to be a human decision-making at the end of a process to make sure that the machines are not running themselves. Now, we have just been discussing a bit on beforehand, is this good that there is a human in the end being obliged to interfere at the end? Because if you want to use the full potential of AI, you may even come to the contradictory uh, viewpoint, saying that it's much faster and more efficient if there is no human mistake in the system, even if it comes at the end. Probably you as notaries, and I feel a bit underdressed today without tie, I know, but uh, I've been told that it's uh, smart casual here, so I hope that you forgive me. But notaries for sure are the best place to um, oversee a pro process of AI and to act correctly. But uh, for a lot of legal procedures, I have doubts if they are really faster. Um, and therefore, we have to make a very deep discussion about how to tap the potential of AI. So you see 
you see more benefits probably to, to start with. I'm an optimist, let's put it like this. <laughs> okay, Simona Constantin, uh, your views as well as policymaker working in uh, Mrs. Jourova's uh, cabinet, you've been, uh, I guess, involved quite closely in elaborating some of these laws which uh, have been adopted and, and are still in the pipeline now uh, when it comes to digitalization in the legal field. So tell us about your perspective. Uh, good afternoon, first of all, and well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to see the, the notaries are organizing such, such an event, which will cover things which are not, you know, just about the notarial profession, but a lot, a lot of, you know, societal implications. Um, turning to your question, I mean, digitalization is clearly the future, you know, when we talk about law and legal professions. Um, and it's not about technology, you know. Technology is just the tool to have digitalization, but digitalization ultimately it's about doing business. Also the legal professions, you know, they are service providers and they serve customers, they serve our, our citizens. So I would see this as an opportunity for them uh, and also as an opportunity for, for customers because you know, more and more people, they want faster services, they want cheaper services, more accessible uh, services, um, with more, you know, available information, so transparency. And that's something that, you know, digitalization can deliver in, in, in these fields. So um, definitely an opportunity from this perspective. I think also from a, let's say, business perspective, but also customer satisfaction. Um, for example, with what we see currently in terms of labor trends, uh, with remote working, also legal professions uh, will be able to, you know, attract talent to hire people from a wider geographical area if you're not confined just to, you see, work from an office from a certain location. So you will have better expertise for your law firms from, you know, other uh, legal professions and this will make you more competitive and then also, you know, you can uh, maybe have a better return uh, in terms of, of the needs of, of the customers. So I would say lots of uh, opportunities. Of course, there are also challenges, you know, there are um, risks. Maybe one challenge for <laughs> regulators will be how to actually keep up the pace with technological development, because we are not always very fast in, in regulating, of course, we need to do it right, so sometimes it takes time for the right reasons because you have to think through all the implications, but uh, we will need to continue. An area which will, will probably need adjustments will be the adjusting private law to all the digital transition. Think about AI, think about uh, cloud contracts, you know, autonomous contracts. This is an entire area of law or liability, again. So and ensuring the, the legal certainty of these. Absolutely, uh, ensuring the legal well. certainty. So it will be also uh, the child. Another challenge will be skills, but also safety, security mm -hmm. uh, for for people. Um, in, a, in a totally different environment. As in well. a totally different environment, but I think we stand on good grounds to get this right. You know, we have a long standing European tradition in developing standards. Think about the data protection. You know, by now it's a bit of a global standard which we try to roll out. Um, so, yeah, I would say overall uh, we, you know, we stand good grounds. I'm also an optimist. To, to make the, the best uh, out of this. Okay, so two rather optimist views. Jens Bormann, tell us about the way you see the challenges and opportunities um, in your profession um, when it comes to digitalization. Well, I think there are huge uh, potentials and huge uh, chances. Uh, I'm also quite a very optimist. Um, I think we have seen over the last 20 years um, a lot of progress in digitalization in our profession. Uh, we started with archives, highly secure archives, with uh, registers for last wills, lasting powers of attorneys. We run nowadays a certification authorities for um, uh, qualified electronic signatures. We got some incentives from the 
commission here uh, with the digitization uh, directive and created an online uh, authentication, online incorporation uh, tool, also highly secure when you can read out um, uh, uh, the ID cards, uh, the, the photos and the European EID, which is established by the EIDAS uh, regulation. Um, so there are really wide uh, fields uh, where we already are digital, um, but I think we now have to look into the future. And uh, there, of course, artificial intelligence uh, will play a very important role. Uh, I think I would say we could even say that we are desperate for AI tools. Why? Um, if you have a look on the demographic uh, situation, um, unfortunately um, one third of our employees, for example, in Germany will get retired over the next uh, five to seven years. And if we want to keep a high level of legal certainty, if we want to ensure access to justice for citizens and if you want to keep the quality of our services we have to find some ways to optimize simple things to digitalize simple things nonetheless of course we want to keep an individual contact we want to provide tailor-made uh, solutions and we want to keep the diversity and the flexibility of the law which is very important for a successful market economy uh, so I think it will be challenging times, but there are lots of chances. And um, uh, we have several new projects now on the European level. For example, the EIDAS uh, wallet, uh, which uh, gives a new uh, possibility uh, to, uh, uh, to link uh, attributes. So notaries could certify attributes, capacities of people, professional, whatever attributes. We could uh, link um, uh, powers of attorney through this. We are currently working on a blockchain-based uh, system of powers of attorneys in Germany um, to replace uh, paper-based um uh, documents. Uh, then we have the eCodex project, which is also very promising, uh, and we hope that uh, in the near future we will be able to exchange securely electronic documents from one member state to the other and uh, to read out the signatures on a European-wide uh, basis. And is, that, is that already helping procedures uh, go faster? Uh, this is helping, of course, uh, procedures to go faster. Um, uh, unfortunately, still, it's now very often over only on the national level. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, I have here my, my colleagues, for example, from, from Munich, uh, Jens Kirchner, the head of our IT council, and when he has something, he wants to incorporate a company and he needs, a, let's say, a power of attorney, a declaration from me, I send it electronically to him. And he can simply print it out or even implement it directly, send it to the register. Unfortunately, I cannot do this yet with our Italian colleagues or Spanish colleagues who do it also on a, on a national basis, and there we have to create, and we are currently creating a tool, for example, to read out uh, signatures from other member states. But this is still, let's say, traditional digitalization. It's not AI, uh, but AI is also very important uh, because without AI, we won't be able to manage our processes in the future anymore. We'll, we'll go deeper into AI a bit later. Um, and this is a good introduction for the next speaker, Tan Yu Yuan. So uh, you're the CEO of a company who is involved in digitalization and AI projects for enterprises and also for large uh, public administrations. So what do you see as the challenges and opportunities uh, brought by digitalization in the legal field? And what are the practical problems that you're helping them to solve? So, thanks a lot. Um, maybe to, to add to the, the other speakers, I'm also an optimist. I think by, if you're coming from the startup world, you have to be an optimist by definition, otherwise you can't be there. But before this startup life of mine, um, I used to be a M&A and finance lawyer. And the reason why I'm sitting here as a representative of a tech startup in Germany is exactly because of a challenge that we saw about four years ago. and is. It is the challenge that Jens Bormann mentioned. It is the situation that due to demographics, we see the, the inevitable um, situation that if you look at the judiciary in, in Germany, that half of all the judges and prosecutors will retire till 2030. And this process will not start like in five years or so. This process will start in two years. And 
the thing is with with our profession, with the legal profession, right? If you if you have like a medical problem and you you lack doctors, you can invite doctors over to Brussels from India, from China, wherever, right? But if you have a legal problem, if you have a, a court case or if you have an administrative problem, you cannot solve this issue by inviting people over from other countries. The only way to solve it is to either you get more people to work in your sector, and at least for Germany, there are very bad news. We don't have more people to work in the sector. Actually, if you look at the statistics over the last years, the number of law graduates has has, has been sinking gradually, and up to 40% less of law graduates are graduating every year con compared to the last years. So, so the, only, the only solution to this problem, in our opinion, the only solution to this challenge, in our opinion, is like a smart digitalization of the processes with a goal of increasing the efficiency of, of processes in the justice sector, in the public administration sector, and this is actually the reason why I started our startup Codify like, like a couple of years ago. And um, fortunately, we, we see that the track record that we have is, is quite okay for a startup company trying to help and solve problems in the justice and, and public administration. I think a, a, several um, states um, or regional governments in Germany, several regional governments and, and, and ministries of justice is already adopting our technologies in, in civil procedures and criminal procedures. We have started to work with, um, also with the public administration on, in, on the fe federal level in Germany. And if you, if you were asking about like practical experiences, um, let, let me give you a couple examples. For, in, for instance, like one area where we are activists in is um, the, the issue of mass claims uh, arising especially from um, these, these, this diesel scandal or the, the exhaustion the engine scandal, gates, right? Yes. And what we achieved there is before the use of our software, a judge had to work through all these, these files in a manual way, which took about one hour. And after using our software, this time is now shortened to five minutes. So you have a multiplication of efficiency by, by using software. And the judges that work with our tools say they don't even, they not only shorten the time that they need to work on these cases, they also feel an increase of quality. So you have, you have it both. And short, like, efficiency increase and quality increase. But also in other areas that we're active in, it's like general, more complex litigation, um, judges are reporting who are working with our software they, that they have an increase of 30 to 40 percent of the speed of their work, and at the same time they, they feel that the quality of their work gets better. So, so the judges it's, are happier. It's, we're not doing so bad, so. <laughs> and the judges are also doing even better. So that's uh, always good to hear. Um, I'm going to be switching to French now um, for the last speaker. So if you need interpretation, I think this is provided uh, now. I'll just leave you a, a second to put your uh, headset on. Um, Monsieur Ramon Franco, uh, enchanté de pouvoir vous uh, parler en notre belle langue française, même si vous êtes espagnol. Uh, vous êtes chef d'entreprise, donc aussi uh, impliqué dans tout ce qui est uh, technologie digitale. Um, donc, La question est à peu près la même. Quelle est votre perspective quant aux défis et aux, aux opportunités aussi de la digitalisation dans le domaine euh, des professions légales Et quels sont les problèmes pratiques euh, que, que vous aidez à résoudre pour les entreprises Bon, euh, tout d'abord, merci aux organisateurs pour l'invitation. Et bien sûr, avec, euh, merci à tout le monde pour partager ces, ces quelques minutes qu'on va être ensemble. Alors, euh, nous sommes tous d'accord, évidemment, et les possibilités sont énormes. Et bien sûr, comme il y a des défis, et je vais essayer de, de par en parler un peu des, des deux. Et nous sommes confrontés à des techniques qui nous simplifient le travail. Alors, c'est une formidable opportunité, et il faut en profiter, bien sûr. Et ce qu'on connaît sur euh, le monde des, des notaires et des avocats, et la génération des brouillons d'actes électroniques, des accords, des contrats. Avec ces technologies, nous partons d'un point, un point de départ plus élaboré, sur lequel travailler un peu plus tard. Mais il faut après introduire les nuances, l'expérience personnelle et le bon sens. Alors, vraiment, les machines ne livrent pas un produit final, 
Elles fournissent généralement un brouillon contenant des idées et des analyses utiles. Bon, ça, nous connaissons bien tout le monde. Aussi, ils peuvent produire des analyses biométriques, comme vous savez, très intéressantes pour le monde des notaires, où euh, ils peuvent fournir des indices pour des actes de foi, euh, des réflexions sur l'état mental des participants, sur le, sur le niveau de compréhension de ce qu'on est en train d'expliquer. Et ce ne sont pas des preuves, ce ne sont que des indices, des arguments pour que le jugement final est ultérieur des notaires ou des, des, notaires ou, ou des avocats. Nous disposons de ces outils, ils vont nous aider avec un certain succès, ça il faudra en parler après, parce que ce sont des indices, mais il faudra prendre bien attention à tout ça. Mais nous devons sans doute nous appuyer sur les mêmes. Euh, quels sont les défis On les connaît à peu près, presque tout le monde. Comment diffuser correctement le potentiel de l'intelligence artificielle auprès du personnel de les entreprises et des citoyens en général Comment former correctement les gens de son utilisation Comment protéger notre propriété intellectuelle, notre savoir-faire Comment garantir la confidentialité des requêtes Comment détecter l'erreur, le bias entre, que la machine peut introduire Comment donc garantir la, véra, la véracité de la réponse Comment garantir notre indépendance via un vie des grandes entreprises mondiales Comment être à l'avant-garde tout en protégeant notre droit, notre droit Alors, euh, dans mon avis, s'isoler légalement, vouloir, vouloir imposer notre règle de jeu, dans nos avis, n'est pas la solution. Et le marché et trouve toujours la forme de contourner les, la réglementation locale en délocalisant les points de production et de services vers les zones les plus avantageuses dans le monde parce que nous sommes dans, une, dans un, un monde globalisé et dé, délocalisé. Alors, ça c'est un point très intéressant, intéressant aujourd'hui à discuter. Dans notre avis, les clés sont dans la formation des nouvelles générations et, très important, dans la simplification des règles de jeu. Parce qu'on ne peut pas s'éloigner de, de, de nos concurrents. Nous voulons protéger notre société et nos citoyens, bien sûr, nous voulons les protéger. Mais si nous prenons du retard dans l'utilisation de nouvelles technologies et leurs limites, Vraiment, nous sommes en train de protéger notre société. C'est un grand débat parce que, dans, dans notre avis, la surprotection conduit souvent à la faiblesse. Et ce sont normalement les plus audacieux qui progressent et deviennent les plus forts. Euh, nous souhaitons ne pas tuer l'initiative avec une réglementation excessive. Okay, thank you. So um, a bit of a, a warning as well uh, here. Understand not to overdo it um, when it comes to uh, regulation, at least. Uh, Simona Konstantin, um, maybe to get the um, discussion uh, started now. Um, so can you tell us more about what the European Commission has been pushing through uh, over the past years in terms of promoting the use of digital technologies in the judiciary? Uh, what was the EU strategy uh, there? And um, do you see, or does the Commission see, full digitalization as some kind of a holy grail there to pursue? Thank you. Now it works. Um, I have been personally working in, in the area of company law, you know, civil law since 2014. And when I started this, you know, looking at let's say the legislation we had at that time, you know, with the proposals that we were developing. This element of digitalization, you know, 
it was coming a bit on an ad hoc basis, you know, here and there, a little element, you know, case by case, but it wasn't certain, uh, certainly not under a, you know, horizontal policy approach. It was not like this. I think, let's say, the big breakthrough or first true moment of digitalization of, you know, law and, and uh, legal professions came is still in the last commission mandate around 2017 when we actually put forward this proposal on digitalization of company law, which is about basically it's procedural company law. It's about, you know, how do you establish companies? How do they manage to have operations across borders? You know, how do they manage to fulfill their obligations towards national authorities? And that's when we really moved to also ensure that you can do all this digitally. And I, I remember when we started to work on this project, I mean, we went through many emotions because many stakeholders were actually quite reluctant to this. And well, my friends, <laughs> the notaries, <laughs> the notaries were one of the concerned stakeholders. Huh? And I mean, Rightly so, they had pertinent concerns, you know, because they wanted to understand, okay, how will this impact our profession? Can we make all this secure if it happens online? You know, it's a very trusted uh, profession. Will people still trust us? You know, what will happen? So we realized, look, we have to do this in a partnership. So we really sat together and, you know, I think at the end it was a very successful uh, project because we, we had to build on the existing technological solutions at that moment, but I think also for um, notaries, you know, they realized, look, this is about the future. Also, if we want our profession to remain competitive, we will ultimately need to move into these digital solutions because the pressure comes also from, from people. So this was, I, I would say, the first big project and it was under this wave of the digital single market, which was the agenda at the, at the time. But then we had COVID, and it was an entire game changer, huh? because we saw what happens when you don't have also digital tools available. The courts were paralyzed, many things were paralyzed. And then this was a boost actually for member states to invest also nationally in digitalization, because this was, for us also an obstacle in the past because many times we were trying to, you know, propose something digitally, they were saying, oh, but this comes with cost, it's not a priority, do we need it? Also, I think the level of development of the justice area, maybe it was not at the level of trust and interaction as we have it today. So with COVID, you know, everybody had to move into, okay, we need to get this going now. So going beyond the realm of company Going board. beyond, so we no longer had this ad hoc approach, but we actually came with, you know, a horizontal proposal to digitalize the, all the procedures, cross-border procedures, you know, civil, commercial, criminal procedures, digitalize them in the sense that, you know, they should be available also in the digital form, but not take away the usual traditional interaction because mm -hmm. one key aspect of our policy was the fact that okay we should not exclude people we should not leave them behind especially because we talk about uh, access to justice so i think now we we have almost all the procedures digitalized it will be a question of you know refilling in maybe little gaps reviewing how things work and maybe building more of this trustful technological solutions. Uh, um, and that but, process yeah. is still ongoing? The, the, um, the legislative proposal is, is still ongoing? Well, I, I don't think you'll still see something coming until the end of this commission mandate next year. You have recently seen uh, the proposal on further modernization of company law, which, um, you know, it was discussed earlier during the event, which again was, you know, filling in gaps, working more with the uh, various registers, um, having more information available. Uh, but then we will see in the next commission for sure, we will need to continue. An area which I see and I referred to initially is all these aspects of how do we adjust pri private law rules to, to digitalization, you know, like AI liability, um, yeah, cloud contracts and, and everything. So something really for the citizens now, not just for the... 
for the companies. For the citizens, because we will need to continue to take this, you know, empower approach, empower the, the business part, you know, for their services, give them tools to be competitive, but also in, in, empower people, you know, give them more choice, but also, you know, safety, trustful solutions. Okay. Andreas Schraub, uh, you were rapporteur on the Digital uh, Market Act, and you're outspoken as well when it comes to uh, AI. So what do you see um, as the limits when it comes to digitalization in, in the legal sphere? Uh, do you see a risk, for example, that the fundamental rights of EU citizens could be uh, at risk if everything becomes uh, digitalized, like we heard uh, Mr. Franco uh, warning about this? <laughs> Well, I, I think that some data sources that were uh, stored in the past, in, in written, they would maybe burn, but they would never be accessible by big databases and be brought to the web. Whilst with uh, modern technologies, that is for sure a concern that we have to consider more seriously. Um, but there are also protection mechanisms, digital ones, available. But for sure, there is a concern that um, citizens and politics to protect citizens from such risks. Can it mean that we ask, therefore, judges to use digital systems to communicate faster and then print the documents and go back home to work than with the pen on it? No, I don't think so. I think we have to admit that digital tools will be part of all jobs of all um, our society and therefore it's up to us to make sure that the gradual uh, integration of digital is done with uh, reason and with a good explanation and technically sound uh, but like this step by step I think it will be a, a development that we cannot avoid. What we have to admit is that in Europe we are missing the market power for companies um, we just heard the two examples, to grow. Uh, it doesn't make sense to make a tool for Austria because it's just too small. So it's much more interesting to make the tool, let's say at least for half of, of Europe, better even for the whole of Europe, and to have two competing systems. But our, uh, Ramona mentioned it, our digital single market is still, because of the fact that it comes all from member states, especially the law and the, the administrative uh, tools for application of the law, court procedures and so on, they are done at national level and therefore there is not yet a single market. And I think Mr. Bormann has uh, explained that he can uh, send the power of attorney at least um, in digital means uh, to his colleague, but not uh, cross-border. And when we ask more and more citizens to go cross-border because we have a huge problem of manpower in all member states, uh, but I speak now about my own, about Germany, and we make it so complicated to work cross-border, we have seen it in COVID as well uh, uh, as missing digital tools were there, home office or how the French call it, le télétravail, uh, there are different rules all over the place. And member states know that there is a problem, but they don't do anything. Now we are trying with the single market emergency tool at least to make a, make a system operable, but the Commission has to do it, huh? uh, a system operable with QR codes for people that want to work cross-border, leaving apart the A1 form, which is also probably to be printed and to sign, be signed. This we couldn't touch, but at least the work, the, the labor law issues and the health issues ought to be brought in a, in a QR code with the argument, I hope that the French Commissioner will uh, support us on this, because uh, unfortunately some countries are very risk averse on this, um, that if we want to be resilient as European Union in case of crisis, we have for sure have the possibilities and the means to be resilient before the crisis starts, because you cannot invent all this in 10 minutes after the crisis has started. And so it's a bit the same for all the other digital tools. And it means a bit of uh, preventive planning, of forward-looking behavior, and we have to admit one thing, and uh, we see it with the German notaries, I think with European notaries, we are all getting older a lot. And older societies are much less ready to change or to reform than younger societies. 
And this is a bit, I think, politically our problem. It's very difficult to convince our citizens from whatever uh, field of politics to change. Because they say, we have always done like that. For me, it's fine. Let's not touch it. Finished. Bye. And this is very complicated. If you say, no, no, you have to do this. They say, no, we don't want for you. We don't want to change. And even if you explain that with the best arguments, the need for change, they have doubts. And it's human. We should not uh, be bad about that. But we should have, we have to communicate very openly about that. Young societies in Africa, they are much faster because they say we do it like this and shoops, all the young people they switch. In Europe, no one uh, wants to change and uh, this is a concern that is for sure a challenge for national policymakers, but also for European ones. And unfortunately, in the end, it's also then having an impact on business because also in business sense, the swap to new technologies is slow. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's mm -hmm. a rather societal problem. Uh, Jens Bormann, uh, full digitalization, uh, it, for legal professions of you know, all kinds of processes, not just for company law, but also for, for, for private uh, uh, legal acts. Is that something that we should be working towards? And, and do you see limitations maybe to this? And how can notaries work together with digital tools um, to actually enable uh, you know, what they do, which is authentication and things like this? Well, I think there are huge fields for, for full automation. However, I think there is a certain need to, uh, to guarantee uh, well, the application of the rule of law and uh, the access to justice. And the access to justice is, has some individual component. So uh, I think this is in all Western societies uh, uh, an important thing that you get individual justice. And it's also the, the law is, I would say, if you have an algorithm, you get a certain output because everything is automatic, while the law is somehow elastic. So uh, uh, the law can, I think, be adapted to new situations. We live here in Europe, and it's the same it's in most other Western jurisdictions with codifications from uh, the late 19th century, sometimes even older. The Code Civil is 1804, um, but it's still applicable. Why? Because it's elastic. And I think this is a kind of field of tension. So I would say we have to automize uh, simple things. Which we have to, to, to use AI as a, as a kind of um, a technical means uh, to, to facilitate and to, uh, our, our um, activities and to make it more efficient. But I think there should be ultimately a kind of human uh, control. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say this is also very important for the legal efficiency of the system. Why? Because our economy claims for that. It's not the idea of lawyers, but if you are in, in practical business, Business, you are faced every day with whatever individual claims, be it in real estate law, be it in company law, uh, people always want to have uh, solutions for a certain situation, and one situation differs from the other. So there might be areas where there are many similar cases and where you can automate a lot, but there are other areas where you still need uh, a really individual uh, approach. Um, and I think this is quite difficult, but I think we have to make this change also acceptable for society, because I would say that especially such a, a um, profession of, of trust like the notaries and the integrity of business registers, of real estate registers, they are a very important stabilizing uh, element for society. And uh, we will have to be available for, for the digital natives uh, who will use their smartphone, who will come into our offices with a collection of links to some secure, what we have now in our archive, secure storages. But we still have the grandma, which comes with a folder, you know, with old deeds. And this will be the, the reality for the upcoming uh, 20 or 30 years. And uh, our challenge is to serve these different needs, these different uh, uh, people, these different parts of society to keep them together in the same legal system. And this will be challenging, but I think with the help of AI, we will eventually uh, succeed in this change. Um, Mr. Bormann, I understand that the notaries in Germany and in, in other countries as well, uh, in fact, have developed their own digitalization uh, projects. So wh why haven't you hired private IT companies uh, to do this work? Are you aiming for some kind of digital sovereignty uh, in your profession? 
a very important thing. The question in the future, I would say the decisive question is not if we do something digitally. I think this is self-understanding. It's a reality. I think it's a question rather who does it. Uh, is it are activities carried out uh, only by the private market? Are they carried out by, let's say, um, service providers from countries we don't like? so much anymore, like Huawei or, or others, uh, or by big American companies who might be in, in conflict here with, uh, or with uh, uh, the new tasks of your uh, commissioner here with a uh, competition uh, department, or uh, do we want to have in certain spheres some public elements? And that's our vision. We believe that in certain key areas, and we believe that the data on real estate, for example, is a key area because this data, you know, is still needed in 200 years. We still operate with, with old rights, with old deeds uh, from the 18th, 19th century. Um, and that in these areas, we should have a certain public infrastructure for the citizens. Of course, this public infrastructure can be built up and maintained and transformed with the help of private companies. But I think we need a kind of residual um, knowledge in the public sphere to manage the process. And um, we should also think of operating certain key areas, IDs, for example, but I would also say uh, real estate registers in the public sphere. sphere. And I have to admit, uh, also even me, I have to admit, I have to admit uh, they have been pushing all the lawyers in Germany to buy their systems uh, because everyone has to have in Germany the Besondere Elektronische Anwaltspostfach and the notaries have said they manage this. So the sovereign trend that they have been pushing is something that we all experience as lawyers. Mm -hmm. And you think it's, it's, it's a good thing? But I still have a card in my pocket, so <laughs> I see what I have. Uh, but the trend of digitization for sure is going on. Okay. Uh, Chan Yu Ran, um, uh, turning to you now about artificial intelligence because your company is involved uh, in this and so you're helping make some processes faster. But do you see as well limitations uh, to this and areas in which human intervention absolutely needs to be kept? Yeah, def definitely. So th this whole discussion surrounding AI is very complicated and, and also somewhat misleading. I mean, the, the term itself is very problematic. You, you say artificial intelligence and suddenly people who are not very deep into technology uh, imagine this algorithm to act like a human being, to act like a notary, act like a lawyer, which is definitely not the case, right? Um, it's, it's, it's very crucial for us to have an understanding both of the technology, what, what it really does, how it works, and also have a good understanding of what is it that lawyers, notaries, and so on do. And, and there's a lack of understanding from both sides. When I talk to technologists, um, <laughs> usually from, from large American tech companies, they say, yeah, it's, yeah, what you lawyers do is super easy. It can be totally automated 100% and then everything is going to be super fast and so on and so on. And this shows a very huge lack of understanding what it means to, to make normative decisions. It's, it's, it's not, especially if we think about this, this state-of-the-art AI technology surrounding generative language models, it's, it's, it's not statistics what we do, right? It's, it has something to do with deduction, with logic, and there is a big gap between what the modern AI systems do and what legal decision-making is about. Um, at the same time, we also need to come from the legal perspective and to, to have a notion of, and this is something Jens Bormann also touched on, it's, it's to have a good view on which parts of the legal decision-making process can be um, responsibly automated by AI technology or whatever technologies, uh, IT technologies you, you are thinking of, and which parts are the parts that can and should not be automated because usually these are the parts where, where lawyers as us need to think about very hardly on a, on a topic and to think about, okay, is, is this specific case really covered by the law or, or not? These definitely are the areas where we don't want AI to take part in the decision-making process. But there are a lot of areas, and, and fortunately, these are usually the parts where human beings think, okay, this is 
tedious work. This is terrible work. I don't want to do anything with it. This, this fortunately, are the parts where AI can help a lot. But it, it definitely needs to be a nuanced approach, and we definitely need to find a nuanced answer. And in the end, it's, it's very, very important to keep the human being and to keep the human judgment um, in the loop. Ramon Franco, euh, une question en français hein, pour vous. Est-ce que vous partagez cet avis Effectivement, l'intervention le, le, humaine demeure, selon vous, essentielle dans certains domaines Et euh, si oui, lesquels Oui, bien sûr. Bien sûr. Euh, il faut comprendre que euh, ces machines, il y a l'intelligence artificielle. Ce qu'elle fait, c'est calculer. Calculer beaucoup. Ils sont très puissants, mais ils ne font que des calculs de la mathématique vraie puissante. Alors, il faut comprendre que la statistique, les algorithmes, arrivent jusqu'à un point, mais ils s'arrêtent là. Le bon sens, l'expérience, comprendre le contexte de la question, comprendre si la question a été bien posée, ça c'est très difficile pour une machine en ce moment. En ce moment. Alors, euh, le bon sens est fondamental, on doit s'appuyer sur euh, ces instruments, sur, sur cette technologie, mais en tout cas, on ne peut pas avoir peur, ça ne va pas nous euh, substituer, parce qu'ils ne font qu'un calcul statistique pour, dans toutes les occasions, proposer quelque chose. Mais ça sera à nous de voir si cette proposition a un air semblable à un air intelligent ou non. Alors, il faut faire attention et, et il ne faut pas avoir peur à ce type de, de technologie. Moi aussi, je voudrais faire une petite réflexion parce que tout le monde en parle dans la, les points faibles euh, en ce moment et qu'est-ce qui peut, euh, qu qu peut venir de l'intelligence artificielle on parle toujours de l'automatisation des procès. Et d'accord, bien sûr, ça c'est complètement vrai et c'est une grande aide. Moi, je voudrais faire une réflexion aussi sur un point très important pour que les compagnies puissent introduire ces, ces technologies chez eux. Il faut travailler un peu plus sur la qualité des données. La qualité des données, ça c'est quelque chose qu'on n'a pas très bien compris encore. C'est une réflexion un peu technique, euh, pardon, parce que moi je viens d'un monde de technique, mais c'est important de comprendre si vous avez vraiment l'intérêt de vous introduire sur ces instruments qui sont très puissants. La qualité des données se base sur l'expérience de toutes les compagnies qui ont un savoir-faire et qui doivent laisser à ces machines s'entraîner sur ces données et pas sur un monde généraliste. Alors, ce que je veux dire sur ça, c'est que avant, il y avait un problème pour euh, automatiser la, la connaissance et le, le fonctionnement de ces machines. Il fallait donner les données, il fallait les produire sur des formats rigides, des tables, des champs, il fallait structurer l'information. Ça, ce n'est plus le cas. Ces solutions, ils peuvent y réfléchir, analyser sur un monde complètement flexible et il ne faut pas travailler sur le format. Mais oui, il faut travailler sur comment on entraîne ces machines. Et, et, et L'information doit être spécialisée, surtout pour les avocats, surtout pour les notaires, ils doivent travailler sur son monde, pas sur un monde généraliste. Il ne faut pas que l'information soit fausse, soit vague, et les questions soient mal posées. Et il faut préparer les machines pour qu'ils puissent s'entraîner bien. Ce n'est pas une tâche facile. Il faut mettre des personnes spécialisées sur son monde pour nous aider. Mais c'est une nécessité qu'on a vue que les compagnies n'ont pas encore compris. Ils ont ces données, ils veulent que l'intelligence artificielle commence à travailler sur, sur ces données, mais les données, sont, quelquefois, n'ont pas la bonne qualité pour travailler sur elles. Je vais essayer d'expliquer de, de, ça. Vous connaissez très bien ce monde. Alors, 
euh, un, un, un petit exemple. Si sur ChatGPT, on pose une question euh, sur euh, un cas juridique, normalement, il peut répondre avec une réponse qui est universelle et qui est internationale. Ça, ça peut être bien pour quelqu'un qui veut comprendre de la France ou de la Belgique quest ce qui se passe en Amérique. Bon, ça, c'est bien. Mais s'il veut une réponse très concrète pour lui en Belgique, peut-être ce n'est pas un bon cas, il n'y aura pas une bonne réponse. Alors, il faut introduire ces technologies sur la base de données et la connaissance de chaque bureau. Bien sûr, en, en Allemagne, ils sont en train de faire un, un grand effort pour concentrer la connaissance et les données sur sa terminologie et sur sa jurisprudence locale. Mais il y a quelquefois où le bureau consulte à chaque DPT et ont une réponse qui est, plus, qui est trop universelle et qui n'est pas concrète sur, sa, sur sa, son cas juridique local. Alors, le défi et il faut introduire ces, ces, ces technologies chez toi, même chez ton bureau, pas peut-être chez Allemagne, bien sûr que oui, mais dans, dans ton bureau, parce que ton bureau est spécialisé sur quelque chose de bien concret, il faut introduire ces technologies chez toi. Ce n'est pas facile, bien sûr, hein, ce n'est pas facile. Mais il faut comprendre que la qualité des données va vous donner une réponse de plus qualité. C'est un défi, c'est un défi. Comment faire que ces technologies qui sont très complexes introduire chez toi, dans ta maison, dans ta compagnie C'est un défi, il faudra, avoir, il faudra essayer parce que, parce que ça, ça a besoin de gros investissements, bien sûr, et, et de l'appui de techniciens que quelquefois on ne veut pas ou on n'a pas l'habitude, mais il faut le faire et ça sera la clé pour être vraiment un bon compétiteur. Okay, Simona Constantin, um, maybe to try and close this discussion on, on AI and, and automation, uh, but do you see clear examples where human intervention is still absolutely uh, necessary? And on AI, do you see uh, a threat maybe looking forward that, um, you know, some of the fundamental values Uh, of the EU legal system could be put at risk from, from these technologies? Um, thank you for the question. Um, if you look at what we have so far in Europe in terms of AI, I think we have a vision. And when we developed this vision, you know, the AI strategy, we said, okay, we want to, you know, have AI in, in Europe. We see this as, you know, coming with benefits, opportunities, but we wanted to do it our way, the European way. So we've built it based on what we have currently. And what we have in Europe is, for example, very high consumer protection standards, respect for fundamental rights, you know, really the citizen at the center. So this human center approach is really the core of the entire AI vision. What will be very important is, um, you know, to see a good final outcome of the AI Act, which will be the foundation in terms of legislation. Um, and then building on this, probably what we will need in the future, well, we will need good enforcement, but also maybe to go a bit more sectorial uh, on, on, on the AI uh, needs. Um, of course, you know, everything that is new comes with fears, but, uh, you know, You cannot have change if fear will take over. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's clear. So, I mean, we are in control of the AI. We are developing it, you know. We will stay at the command. Uh, it's not that AI will get so much wiser than people. We, it's more about how wise the people doing the AI will be in terms of, for example, AI uses. You can use it in the military sphere. Uh, you can use it, uh, for example, um, for meteorological interventions, you know, all the sensors we have to collect meteorological data and then even to influence and to have some rain. Um, uh, or, for example, we will need to look at the impacts on children, you know, like better internet for children. Or what does it mean in terms of uh, liability? Uh? 
product liability or services, you know, if you are ran over by a robot on the street, um, who is to blame, you know, is the producer of the robot, is uh, the company putting the data in the robot, I mean, who is it? So, um, I, I would not say that, you know, we should fear AI in this sense, it's more about, you know, dealing with it, continuing our European approach. And the Commission will deal with it when the problems come, I'm not, not anticipating things. No, well, no, I will not put it like this. I think we already rolled out quite a lot. You know, we have put forward this legislation on the AI Act. We are working on this better internet for children. We have a targeted legislative proposal on, on AI liability. Uh, but, of course, it has to come, you know, we need the, the co-legislators to be on board. Um, so, it has to continue to, to be a, a partnership. Yeah. So, Andrew Schraub, you're among the co-legislators there. So, what, what is your view about the limitations that should be brought to things like AI in the legal uh, environment? Well, I would like first to s say that this AI, AI Act is for sure an important start, but there are already other fields covered by other legislation because AI, in the end, is not that much more um, than uh, an algorithm that is already used. The only difference is the, the database, which is far bigger, and the speed between the database and the algorithm in use. So I think we should also be a bit uh, prudent, um, believing that the AI discussion and the AI act is changing the world. The patterns behind economically, but also um, in relation to their um, output, are very similar to other tools that we know and that are already bound by other laws. So your question with a focus on the legal application is a bit of a challenge because to a certain extent um, we cannot limit it to legal procedural or material questions as they are also linked to the real world. But the, um, the um, uh, elements of applying specific systems to uh, databases that are national or uh, notary internal or specific to one a notary uh, is feasible nowadays mm -hmm. and there is even a trend to put the uh, the whole tools back to small um, technical units like mobiles by putting um, the, the large databases closer in the cloud to the user so this is all possible the question is from your point that you were addressing to me can we really limit this on legal profession or is the legal profession or the legal profession not so much closely interlinked with society that you cannot really draw the line saying it's possible here and possible there. Mm -hmm. I think it will come in all over the place and we need for, therefore general rules and then as in the past for all the different areas mm -hmm. separate rules and the key for this is that they are done out of one belief and what we see at the moment and this is not only the fault of the European Commission, um, but also a bit, Ramona, uh, it's also a bit the fault of the European Commission, they are not coming out of one hand. They are a bit um, uh, coming from all different areas with different people at different ideas at different places. And that makes it for a certain moment now quite complicated to understand how they should all interact in one system. And that's what lawyers, what for lawyers matters. Uh, th th in the end, there has to be a, a harmonized holistic system where you can use it. And I think this is a task that we have still to prove uh, um, because so far there are plenty of good ideas, but in the, in the DMA we have dealt with strongly about economic concerns. In the DSA we have been also strongly been dealing with uh, fundamental right concerns. And with the AI Act, we, we combine now a bit uh, um, AI, uh, technical questions with fundamental rights question, that's all fine, but it's not yet a, two, a, a holistic viewpoint that a lawyer can then integrate into his practice. And I think that's the challenge ahead of us. It will be very difficult to say, yes, for legal practice, it's fine. There are tools to use it, but these tools will only be competent if they really can mm -hmm. grab into a system which is holistic. Yeah, and then at some point, 
will go sectoral when, when the time comes. Um, let me turn now to the audience uh, for some questions. Um, if there are any uh, here physically in the room who want to ask questions, we have a microphone which is uh, now available. So don't hesitate to raise your hand. And in the meantime, maybe if there are questions online, ah, I see a hand raised here. J'essaie en français. Alors, euh, j'ai appris, Monsieur Chouan, euh, sur votre projet, ou pas projet, mais votre logiciel que vous servez pour, pour les juges, pour euh, les cas de pollution. Et euh, alors, moi, à mon avis, il faut développer l'intelligence euh, artificielle aussi au plan de vue de droit. Mais je demande, est-ce qu'il faut une formation additionnelle alors moi, à la fac, j'ai appris comment on applique le droit. Hein? Il y a des systèmes, je ne connais pas les mots français, mais vous savez tout, il y a un système quand on applique le droit. Et ma question est, est-ce qu'il faut une autre formation pour appliquer l'intelligence artificielle en prenant des décisions au plan de le droit, comme juge, comme notaire, je ne sais pas quoi. C'est ma question. Can you please introduce yourself as well? Euh, moi, mon nom, c'est Jens Kirchner, je suis notaire à Munich. Merci beaucoup. Pardon. Merci beaucoup, M. Kirchner. Um, let me answer in Chinese. <laughs> so, uh, from what I've, I have understood with my um, very old, back in the history of French knowledge is, um, if the question was if it was important to, to have like specialized systems or specialized um, um, skills um, purposefully developed for the judiciary and, and both on the technological and, and, and skill side, the, the answer is definitely yes. It's, it's, I think it's pretty much something that Mr. Schwab also introduced. The, this whole development, um, if you think about the beginning of the year with um, chat GDP like, um, yeah, going crazy around the world um, with, with having these huge models, I think the, in the end how the world hopefully will go is to have very specialized models that are um, specially created for certain fields such as certain parts of the law, not, not even the judiciary on, on, a whole, on its whole, but, but certain parts of the law. And um, this is, I think, something that where we hopefully should see the future go because as Ramon also, I think, pointed out, um, these system that are systems that are very popular these days are on, only on the surface they make sense. But the moment you go deeper into detail, they, they fail. They fail miserably. But they fail in a way that sounds very convincing and thus misleading. Um, so I hope, I, I do hope that we move into the direction where we recognize how important it is to have a very good quality base of the data that we use in order to train or adjust these systems. And um, I, I hope this is the way where we will go. And I hope this somehow answers your question. Yes and no, I would say. I, I think if, if the judge needs special training to use this AI, the company developing the tool has made a, not a good job, right? Um, it's, it's, the, the, the approach or the goal should be that we develop a tool that can be easily and safely used even by us lawyers, right? But at the same time, and, and this goes back to what, what I said a while ago, it's, it's very, this, this term artificial intelligence is very, very misleading in a bad way. People imagine a lot of stuff and most of the stuff is just wrong. The, even though the thing is called AI, it does not do what you do if you think about as a lawyer on, on, on like very hard issues. But if we put this label AI on a box and say, wow, this is the AI, it was trained uh, with all the data available of all notaries in the world, suddenly you as a human being, you are humbled and say, wow, I'm just one notary here in Germany, but this machine is supposed to know everything around the world. How can I, with my judgment, overrule whatever this machine has, has put out, right? So, so this is very, very tricky. And, um, 
so so I, I think it makes a lot of sense that, that judges and all lawyers from, from all domains have a better and deeper general understanding of of the fundamentals of, of what this technology is about and where the limitations are. Well, if, if you allow me, I would Go like ahead. to make a comment on this because I think your question was rather about can a lawyer trust 100% this application and makes, makes maybe a two-day uh, uh, application, f uh, a weekend to understand how to enter the content? Or is this technology so important that in the study, Every lawyer has to understand the basic functioning behind himself to control the outcome himself. Because, I mean, Ramona said for the procedural staff, uh, no problem. But if, I mean, we have more and more court decisions, and I think even for professional notaries, it's difficult to keep everything in mind. So if you are trusting an AI system that takes all the German court decisions about how to uh, store a document correctly, that there is an ownership behind or whatever, does it mean that you can just make AI working and then say, ah, okay, that's the, the conclusion, I, I apply it? Or do you have to say, but this is bullshit, this cannot be, I have to check if in the system on, on uh, algorithm page two, three, I don't know how you, how, how you manage this, there must be a mistake, there is a, the, the wrong numbering. So the question is rather, can we trust this? Or do we have to understand all the functioning behind ourselves to be, to be safe? I mean, I think all of us know how to drive, right? Do you know how a car, do you know how to assemble a car? <laughs> but you trust it every day, right? And, and actually it's, it's like using AI, I think will go the same way, but we're still at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think in the end, at, at least that, like, the majority of technologies that we see today, or not the majority, at least this very height technology of large language models that we have today, we, we, we obviously cannot directly trust whatever comes out of it. There definitely needs to be human oversight. But there are areas where we also work in with the German judiciary, where like certain approaches that can also be subsumed to the area of AI are very stable and very reliant, where the judge can rely on what the machine produces. But even, even so, the system that we build is always designed in a way that in the end the human being in this case the judge needs to make the end decision that's definitely the case i mean this follows from the ai act obviously <laughs> and but it but it's also from a technological standpoint i think it's a good idea because where do you draw the line which point is the thing where you say okay trust the machine 100 percent, but in this case you cannot trust the machine right so i think it would be better to it, and you don't even need it. I mean, the, the whole work of a judge can be sped up even without this last aspect of total automation of the decision-making process, right? And if you can speed up the rest of the work and achieve like a higher efficiency of 50% of even, you suddenly digitally double the, the workforce. A problem solved, you don't need the last 2%, right? Okay, more questions maybe coming from the audience because we're also um, getting uh, Short on time, unfortunately. Questions in room or online, maybe? Okay, I see everybody is eager uh, to, uh, to finish the conference. So maybe to wrap up uh, then, let me ask um, well, each one of you uh, in turn uh, to answer very briefly uh, a simple question. Um, if you had one wish, um, technology-wise, um, that technology could do by 2030 in your respective fields, what would that be? Um, and so I'll start with you, Andreas Schraub. Would you like technology to write parliamentary reports for you? No, that I will do myself, but I would like to have it to reply to citizen requests that would uh, take a lot of time away from me and from my advisors. And it would be definitely feasible with AI. <laughs> Simona Constantin. If I, if I were to follow on this wish, you know, we also get access to documents requests, which <laughs> take a lot of time if this could be somehow automated. But um, no, well, um, I, I, I would wish to see some of our proposals materializing on the ground. For example, in this 2030 digital decade, there is a target that by 2030, some key public services will be available also 100% online for citizens. 
I think this would be great to see. Uh, or for example, this uh, liability, civil liability rules for, for AI. Um, again, you know, I wish uh, it would be embedded in civil code. Okay. Jens Bormann, in, in your field, do what do technology do? Uh, actually, I would like to give a broader answer. I would say I would like to uh, get really good AI products with quality data to come back to you because I think this is really very important. Um, and we are doing that currently in Germany with our register assistant taking all the data which has been filed over the last 15 years to the company register. So having good data, having a sectorial approach, maybe with some help also economically from the commission to set up uh, uh, sectorial pr uh, projects and then to merge these sector projects into the holistic system of Mr. Schwab uh, who will then eventually serve all of us to get good legal conclusions. Okay. Uh, Tan Yuran, maybe a wish from your side. I think it would be fantastic if the judiciary, public administration, and the notaries would get an image of being in high tech sector and, and, <laughs> and not a sector with the dust of a thousand years. <laughs> that's, that's a nice one. And uh, in French, maintenant, pour conclure, Ramon Franco. Bon, euh Comme on peut voir ici, ça serait super d'avoir dans quelques années l'apparition d'un traducteur simultané de qualité qui puisse être intégré dans nos objets quotidiens. Quelque chose qui puisse engager une conversation de qualité avec n'importe qui sur la planète. Les techniques de reconnaissance vocale et de traduction sont très avancées, sont très avancées, vous le savez tout le monde. Mais la solution n'est pas encore définitivement mise en œuvre. Et j'espère que dans quelques années, ça sera surmonté ce défi. Et on pourra en parler euh, de forme quotidienne, normale, avec n'importe qui, et simultanée avec une qualité et sur quelque chose qui soit sur nos habits, par exemple. Quelque chose comme ça. J'espère que ça sera un beau défi à supérer. Okay, thank you very much. I think this wraps up today's event. A big thanks to the notaries of Europe for organizing it. Big thanks to our panelists for being with us today um, and to the audience for participating. And I now hand over the floor to, um, well, the organizers for some concluding remarks. I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Simon. Thank you, dear panelists. So, yeah, thank you very much to all of you for all the preparatory work which has been done by the CNE office, uh, Bundesnotarkam, and all together. I think it was a very fruitful event, a very uh, great insights into the new developments, starting with a very specific, concrete uh, project of European piece of legislation, the Digital Tools Directive 2.0. Until then, now our wishes for the future of uh, the notaries and the judiciary becoming one of the front runners of digitalization. I think we have made a good part of this way already, and uh, we will engage to be to be these front runners as this uh, wish has been just expressed. Thank you very much for today. Thank you much for all being here, and also for those following us online, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. <laughs>